Hey there gang, got a fun one here today we don't see very often. This is an Italian made guitar from the 1960s. It's an Echo Cadet, made in this small eastern town of Reconati. And uh, it's kind of cool, got some vaguely Fender-esque vibe to it. Um, I can't really date it exactly, the, res the resources aren't there, it's mid-60s. Uh, it does have a serial number on it, but Apparently it's one of these things where they made up a huge number of plates and they just kept pulling them out of the same bin, that sort of thing. Um, there might be some serious Echo scholars out there who could pin it down closer, but we'll say mid-60s. It's got kind of a sexy Rickenbacker bass shape to it. Echo as a company was founded in 1959, and they produced a number of different series of guitars over the years. Um, mostly taking inspiration from American designs, but some others as well. Like they made a pretty close copy of a Hofner Club Series guitar, of all things. Uh, interest, innovative use of materials, different plastics. Um, it's the 60s in Italy, so they all have this certain kind of panache and style to them, which is really quite attractive. I'm not sure how highly regarded they were as instruments, but they had kind of a heyday there in the late 60s. They also made um, guitars for the American market for Vox, uh, relabeled re for Vox, and then... Um, they also did um, keyboard instruments as well, organs and early electronic keyboards. So that's uh, pretty much all I know about the Echo Company. Uh, they're still in existence today, and I'm sure there are some devotees out there. We're going to see what this one's about. This has had quite a storied past, it seems. It seems at some point this was played as a lefty. There's uh, evidence of a strap button there on the lower horn. At some point, the factory tremolo unit was swapped out for this uh, Fender Jazzmaster style, uh, which might have been a good thing. The original ones were sort of Bigsby-esque units that apparently weren't all that great. There just wasn't enough brake angle to make them function well. And, um, yeah, so this has been Jazzmasterized. The truss rod on this guitar is of a spoked wheel design for the adjuster, which is very nice. Uh, much easier to work with than what was on the Fender guitars of this period. So that's uh, forward thinking of them. Nice design. The pick guard here has shrunk up quite a lot over the years. Um, the Italian plastics are not all that dimensionally stable and at this point only about half the screws are in place because it's moved about a quarter of an inch in every direction. The headstock shape is vaguely familiar, although it's got some more sensual curves to it. And this employs the zero fret design. And unfortunately, the label has long disappeared. It's been rubbed off. This thing is in for a setup. It was previously set up by someone who likes a very low action, and unfortunately, it just couldn't handle it. And this player wants to strum a bit harder than that would allow. Um, so I'm going to plug it in and see what it does. This thing actually offers quite a lot of selection, tone wise. So, yeah, you've got individual switches for each pickup and uh, you can turn them all off too as a kill switch and this guy's master volume and the master tone yeah that works too so everything works that's good Let's have a look at the action here measure at the 12th fret. This thing has no side dot markers, which is very confusing. Yeah, super low. It's about a 32nd of an inch on the bass side. And yeah, about a 32nd on the treble. So that's like 0.75 millimeters. And that's pretty low. There's virtually no relief in this neck either. The sixth fret, we're looking at around, well, there might be a thousandth or two. Too small to slip a feeler gauge under. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to try and put in a little bit of relief if it'll let me. Just sort of loosen that off just a touch. That's around five thousandths.
These old tuners are a little bit stiff, so I'm going to put in just a touch of 3-in-1 oil. A little goes a long way. I took all the string tension off before trying to raise the bridge. Yeah, the strings are sliding back and forth across the uh, zero fret there, and there are some grooves in it that are quite sharp when I'm bending strings, causing that sound. So we're going to have to recrown that zero fret. Luckily, this one is quite tall, and there's enough uh, room for us to do that, no problem. So I filed down below those grooves and recrowned it. I also had to do some light leveling and some of the fret ends were actually rising. I had to glue those down and did some light dressing in the lower reaches here. And up the board there were a couple more that required the same treatment. The intonation is way off. All the strings are playing very sharp, so that means the string length is too short and all the saddles need to move back away from the headstock. If you want to work on fender style saddles, it helps if you can find a Phillips head screwdriver with a very long shaft. It keeps you clear of the body and uh, it gets you out of trouble in a lot of places. Okay, pulling things back here. Unfortunately, the B string and the last couple of strings here, um, I've reached the end of travel because um, the springs are bottomed out. They're completely compressed. Uh, so in order to make this function properly, I'll have to take these out and clip the springs and put them back in. I get the feeling this low E spring will probably be backed all the way down to the end by the time we're done. So I'll be kind of conservative to start off with and just clip about two. And then we'll put this back on and see how far that came. This can be really fiddly work if you're trying to do it with a thing strung up. Okay, we're all buttoned up and ready to go. What do I think of it? It's an interesting guitar. Uh, the pickups are a little beefier than Strat pickups. Um, feel a little bit closer to Jazzmaster or almost P90-ish. Uh, they seem to be relatively high output. And um, it doesn't feel like a Fender product. When you play it, it doesn't feel like a Strat or a Telecaster or a Jazzmaster. It's got its own feeling. Um, good variety of tones achievable from the selections there. Yeah, interesting guitar. Ouch! It's not supposed to look that way. This is a Japanese-made Epiphone from the mid-1970s. Not a tremendously collectible guitar, but the owner really enjoys it. He thinks it sounds great, it plays nicely. But this little mishap up here you know, kind of disturbs him. So we're going to see if we can reduce its visual intrusiveness and um, kind of harmonize the outline a little bit. A plywood top guitar? Why would you bother? It's not worth it. No, 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 no. Take that attitude elsewhere, Buster, because I've enjoyed every single Japanese Epiphone I've picked up and played from this era. They're really fun. For whatever reason, the materials, the design, some kind of alchemy, 
They sound good, they play good, I enjoy them better than I do a lot of other newer guitars that cost more. So I'm going to fix this one, and somebody's paying me to do it. This is one of those Norlin era masterpieces with the kind of bizarre bolt-on fender style neck made by the Yeri company. The action on this is acceptable, but we're kind of bottomed out in terms of the saddle here. It's not a whole lot of brake angle for the lower strings, so uh, we can do a little bit of a neck reset on this at the same time. I don't know how the damage occurred, but it must have been pretty dramatic. The uh, side has caved in slightly in this area, and we're missing the purfling lines and the herringbone that goes in there as well. Splinter the top uh, through a couple of the layers of the plywood. So, in order to fix this, I think the easiest thing to do is I'm just going to route a little half moon shape out of here and inlay a piece of um, genuine spruce. Uh, got a piece here that's pretty close in character. It's a real shame that piece of herringbone there went flying and was never recovered because this stuff here seems to be a different size and character to what's available from Luthery suppliers uh, these days. And um, I don't even keep this stuff on hand because I never use it in my own work. Like, it's such a Martin trademark, you know. Um, if I was going to do a decorative purfling scheme, I would come up with my own design just so that it wouldn't be that, you know. And of course, I need only two and a half inches. So sending away to California, you know, spending all that money on shipping for something that isn't going to match up perfectly anyway just seems like a real waste. So I guess I'm stuck with making my own. And I know that sounds like totally crazy, but you guys don't want to see me do a video where I'm just going to inlay a black, white, black line and forget that it's there, right? So I guess we can discuss a little bit about making your own decorative purflings for this. In decent lighting and with some magnification, we can see how this is made up. The inner lines here, this black, white, black, is uh, probably a piece of plastic or fiber. Those are quite thin lines. Inside that is a dyed piece of veneer. Then we have the first element of the herringbone. There's a very thin white strip of veneer in between that and the second strip, and then another dyed uh, piece of veneer before we get to the binding. Here's the modern stuff on a Larrave. One of the main things is that inner white line there is uh, half again as thick. And uh, I don't know, it's just it's a different appearance. This is some black dyed veneer. Don't know what the species is. It's might be maple, could be birch, and it's around 22 thousandths, just over half a millimeter. So I'm going to make up a lamination of uh, two strips of this. It's good to get all the dust off this stuff before you uh, try to glue it together. There can be, you know, dye particles or just general workshop dust on the surface. I'll cut some larger strips from which to work. So I'm going to end up with two strips of half millimeter veneer. I'm going to glue them up between, I've got a couple of these um, phenolic tabletop scraps. I think they're from a lab table or something like that. They're very dense, very flat and perfect for this kind of thing. I'm just going to use some tape to hold things in place here until I can get the clamps on because the veneer really wants to curl up on itself at this point. One surface is wet and the other is still dry so it's it's in the verge of warping and it's kind of a race to get things in clamps. Needs a lot of clamps. If I had more to do I'd probably break out a vacuum bag. It's time to pare away the loose or broken material in the area of the side which is dented inwards, I'm going to try and separate it from the interior lining there and insert a small wedge to try to bring that back up to level. The side though uh, was not in great shape. It was The plies had loosened and it was kind of fragile. So I decided to inject as much thin super glue into it, uh, try to stabilize that and make it good and stiff again. Taking the now double thickness veneer, I'll go ahead and cut a bunch of thinner strips from it about two and a half millimeters wide. I'm aiming for a purfling that's probably uh, going to be about one and a half millimeters thick. This will give me a margin of error on both sides for misalignment and also for planing it down. I should say that this piece of herringbone I'm going to make is not going to be a super exacting copy of the original. 
In order to do that, I'd have to take each one of these lines and scrape about six thousandths of an inch off them. And that would take a very long time. It's probably not in the budget. I'm gluing these up in smaller batches of five or six, alternating colors. I want a lot of glue. Um, these things will eventually be cut into smaller diagonal strips, so uh, good adhesion is really required, otherwise they can fall apart if you're cutting or planing them later on. To clamp these together, I use these aluminum strips on a flat laminate covered surface. A spray of water there provides enough surface tension that the aluminum stays where I put it. I just snug them up, push them together, make sure it's all flat, wipe off the glue, and move on to the next one. Before gluing up these smaller strips into the large sandwich, I'll go ahead and I'll mark off a 45 degree line and cut that across. This conserves material. I won't lose as much in waste when I glue these up. Second verse, same as the first. I'll just push these all together. To make the central white line and the members of the black white black lamination, I have to scrape down some veneer to half its original thickness. So these end up being about ten thousandths or, you know, just around a quarter of a millimeter thick. As luck would have it, I happen to have a routing template here in my collection from years past that would do the trick. I have no idea what I used it for in the first place, but we might as well reuse it. I'll super glue it in place on the top here little spray of accelerator on the jig portion and get that locked down firmly where it needs to be. I'm going to cut the recess using a router template guide set for inlay which has a bushing that offsets from the bit the right amount that you can cut the uh, recess with the bushing in place, take it off and cut the inlay portion and the two should mate up pretty closely. I've actually misplaced the template here. I should have moved it up so that there would be more material on the, my side of the camera. I just got away with it here. There's just enough material to inlay. I planed that down after gluing it in place with some hide glue. Protecting the top with some paper and tape. Then trying to sand the transition between the two surfaces. Next I want to clean up the channel here so that I can glue on a piece of spruce that will act as a bit of a platform for the purfling lines and the herringbone because those aren't as deep as the um, channel for the binding. We'll square up the ends and try to make that pretty neat. Here's the little strip of spruce. This is old school. This is an Ibex purfling cutter. I'll use that to define the inside line for the purfling. And I'll flatten the bottom of the channel, make sure it's the right depth. I mark the angle and plane the stack of lines for the herringbone. Then I cut some strips on the bandsaw. Sorry I didn't get a good view of this, but my hands are far away and I'm using a push stick. I'm not going to put my fingers in there. So you can see what it's like. We've got the two halves of the chevron pattern. So I glued those together with the thin strip of white veneer in between them. Before putting on the binding and purfling, I decided to seal the patch with some orange shellac. The black white black line goes on first with some super glue. The herringbone is still too thick at this point, so I have to thin that down. I chose the most dangerous method, of course, by uh, sliding my hands over top of this block plane to get the right thickness. Sanding might be um, safer, so I decided to finish off that way. And then uh, I carefully glued that in place. Up next comes a strip of white binding. Once it's cured, I can plane that off level. And also flush it up with the side. I had a feeling this color was going to be difficult to match, and I was right. I started off trying to spray it on using a tinted lacquer. Did not like where that was going, so I sanded that all back down again to bare wood and dyed it using water-based aniline dyes, which was much more controllable and I could build up to the tone I liked. 
After that, I tried to disguise the, um, the line between the two surfaces using opaque pigments, but it just it was not working. It was um, sticking out like a sore thumb, so I had to sand that back, and then started spraying a little bit of lacquer on top to kind of unify things. And eventually I got somewhere where I was, you know, okay with it. Sometimes it can be hard to know when to say enough is enough, and I think I'm rapidly reaching that stage. You can keep striving to improve it by 10% and end up losing 15, and it feels like one of those times, so I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. It looks okay. It's in the same color family. Um, it's not always easy, you know. When you got a horizontal line like this, of end grain to end grain especially, it's just never going to disappear. Um, and for whatever reason, this plywood here just wanted to soak up any color. Even though I sealed the end grain, it just wanted to grab hold of that color and show it off like a dark line. Then you got the 50-year-old spruce here with oxidation and lots of light exposure. And the new stuff just has a different refractive index as well. It looks great from a couple of angles, and some others you can really, it sort of jumps out at you. Just the holographic nature of wood. This new piece is going to darken over the next few years as well. I've seen some repairs where people didn't take that into account, and the patch ends up way darker than the original. Uh, there are ways of getting around that. You could expose it in a UV box for several days, and that will naturally darken the wood. Uh, I just I don't have time for that, or the space, to be honest. The herringbone is kind of similar, um, but somehow mine ended up looking a little more like the modern stuff than I intended. In retrospect, the white lines in the original seem to be smaller than the black slightly thinner. I could have sat there for five hours trying to thin each of those lines out by hand, but you know, I've got other jobs to do as well. And I am happy that I managed to get that big dent out of the side. It's pretty smooth. Still got to put a couple of coats of lacquer on this and let it sit for a week or so before buffing it up, but uh, I think we'll end it here for now. Thanks for watching, stay safe, and uh, we'll see you again soon.